Boldwood presents At the Stroke of Midnight, written by Jenny Keir and read by Lucy Scott. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Summer 1923 Before time completely stopped for Pearl Glenham, she was more concerned with stealing it. And yet, paradoxically, the very reason for stealing it was an attempt to hold on to a moment that has long since passed. By commemorating a specific instant in her life, her birth, she was desperately clinging to that fraction of a second when both she and her mother had been alive. She was a level-headed girl and knew that nothing would change with her sentimental action because time marched forward relentlessly. It was unstoppable. But one delightfully sunny afternoon in July 1923, the universe decided to toy with her. It let her live and relive a few short hours in order to prevent a death. Not her mother's, however, but her own. Pearl was, in many ways, an unremarkable young lady. Her hair, although white blonde as a child, was now a nondescript shade of mousy brown. She had blue eyes, but not the sort of blue to attract any attention or be remarked upon. A cloudy sky, just before the rain, almost grey. She had been academically advanced as a young child, but her potential had dwindled away with little encouragement and no opportunities open to her. Her build was slight, she kept her head bowed low, and her voice was barely above a whisper. But people who appear unremarkable can hide remarkable secrets. Wearing the neatly pressed uniform of a housemaid, Pearl stood outside Boxley Hall in a village six miles from where she lived and watched a scurrying mass of staff prepare for the annual midsummer ball. Gardeners were clipping and sweeping as delivery carts, or in the case of a butcher, a smart black liveried model tea van, pulled into the yard to deposit their wares. She witnessed the occasional hustle and overwhelming bustle of people getting in each other's way, and could hear the frantic instructions of the housekeeper desperately trying to oversee it all. Her heartbeat was already racing as she began to walk towards the servant's entrance, clutching a pile of folded linens. But she did not work at the hall, and the linens were from her closet back home. Avoiding eye contact with anyone, she slipped through the door, down a narrow corridor, and up the back stairs, hoping that one girl in a black cotton dress and freshly ironed white pinny was much like another. No one cared who she was, only that she was busy. She passed a footman holding a tray of silverware. Her heart jolted as she recognised him from church, but he saw through her without really looking and hurried on his way, presumably to work his magic with a tin of silvo liquid polish. She slipped quietly into a small morning room. Glancing about with inquisitive eyes, she noticed an impressive black chinoiserie clock on the mantel, far too large and valuable for her tastes. Then she spotted a smaller Bakelite desk clock on the writing bureau near the window. With swift and silent feet, she swept across the room and pocketed the clock before returning downstairs. After stepping out into the bright June sunshine, she returned to the back of a small shed where she had earlier deposited her bicycle. Placing the linens in the wicker basket, she finally let out a relieved breath and allowed her shaking hands to steady. It took moments to untie the apron and bundle it on top of the tablecloths before mounting the saddle and pedalling up the road. Twenty minutes later, she was heading towards a modest cottage at the bottom of an isolated lane, as a tick-tick from her basket reminded her that, however much she wished it was otherwise, the onward march of time was inevitable. Where have you been? Pearl's father asked as she stepped into the hallway, her cheeks rosy from her exertions and her hair starting to come loose from the low bun fastened at the nape of her neck. She wished she was daring enough to get it cut in a more fashionable bob, 
but instead had compromised by shaping it around her face and tucking the length of it out of sight. Into the village to purchase some more fabric for my undergarments. She clutched the linens and their concealed treasure to her chest, knowing he would not inquire further if the answer to his question was in any way intimate and that he did not have the necessary understanding to ascertain whether she was holding two yards of well for the creation of a chemise or three folded tablecloths borrowed from the linen cupboard. I wasn't expecting you back so early, father. It was unusual for him to be home at this hour, as he always caught the 515 bus from the nearby market town where he had his offices. It dropped him at the top of Parsonage Way at twenty minutes to six without fail, giving him ten minutes to walk the length of the lane, and a further ten minutes. He was a man of alarmingly regular habits who lived an ordered life, and only events beyond his control disrupted his routine. Despite the balmy nature of the day, her father looked unusually clammy and uncomfortable as he wiped the back of his hand across his forehead. He was unsettled, and that, in turn, unsettled Pearl. She noticed he was clutching a small cream envelope and wondered if the arrival of this correspondence might be the cause of such a radical deviation from his schedule. It was addressed to his place of work, yet had personal scrawled across the top in deep blue ink. Her eyes quickly flicked back to her father. She didn't want him to think she was prying. Troubling matters have arisen, and I have come home to attend to them. He glanced at his inexpensive pocket watch and then returned it to his waistcoat. The gold half-hunter that he'd inherited from his own father sat forlornly in a glass dish on his dressing table. It was only handled by Pearl when she dusted and only ever displayed the correct time, four minutes past ten, twice a day, by default. We have been invited to a place called Highcliffe House, a week next Saturday down in the West Country, for a luncheon and evening dinner party. I will make the necessary travel arrangements, but I need you to oversee the packing. My plan is to leave on the Friday for London, where we can catch a train from Waterloo to Weymouth. I shall book accommodation there overnight so that we arrive fresh, sometime late morning, to meet our host the following day. The house is not straightforward to access. Pearl was confused by such out-of-character spontaneity. Social functions were to be avoided at all costs, and they rarely stayed away from home. That's an awfully long way to go for a dinner party, she pointed out. To her knowledge, they had no connections in Dorset, and the whole trip would incur great expense at a time when they did not have money for such extravagances. She was often frustrated by their ever-fluctuating financial situation, never understanding why sometimes they had a surplus, and on other occasions he was asking her to make economies. Surely his salary from the accountancy firm was a steady wage? I agree, he said, but we are going, and that's an end to it. His eyes scanned the invitation again. You must organise suitable clothes for two days travelling and formal wear for dinner. How I detest long journeys stuck on trains with people, he added, almost as an she inquired. Is it to see friends or a matter of business? Purely business. I do not know the people nor the house, but this trip may lead to a change in our fortunes, so you are not to challenge my decision. He looked over to his daughter and then briefly wrinkled his nose, as if considering his attitude might be lacking. Her father had a plain way of speaking, but occasionally caught himself and tried to accommodate what he considered were the frivolous feelings of others, for the sake of good manners, if nothing else. Highcliffe House is situated on top of the limestone cliffs of the Jurassic Coast, which should please you. There is a small private cove beyond the gardens that you can visit, as you are forever harping on about the sea, Pack appropriate footwear. Pearl felt an unbidden flutter of excitement because, alongside her obsession with time, she had an equally enduring fascination with water. However, 
She was confused by her father's blatant contradiction that he did not know the house, when he was obviously familiar with it. She was also wrestling with her own conflicting desires. She had no wish to attend a dinner party, a social occasion she had no personal experience of, with people she did not know, nor to travel halfway across the country in order to do so. And yet, at the mention of the sea, her heart skipped. If she packed her bathing costume, there would surely be an opportunity to visit the cove he'd mentioned and swim in the ocean. It was nearly enough to offset her unease about meeting new people and leaving the sanctuary of their home. Ultimately, however, her opinion would not be taken into consideration, so she would have to do her best to alleviate her worries. They were going because her father decreed it, and it was not open to discussion. I assume, despite your gadding about the village, that there will be a suitable meal on the table for six o'clock? With money often tight, they had not employed a cook for seven years, ever since he'd decided his twelve-year-old daughter was perfectly capable of running the household. Knowing she would be absent for some of the day, she'd already boiled a small ham that morning, so only needed to mash some potatoes and open a jar of pickled beetroot. Of course, father, she confirmed, as she mounted the narrow stairs and excused herself. The landing was dark and gloomy, and the deteriorating thatch that overhung the tiny bedroom windows excluded the light even further. Ducking under the low oak lintel, she entered her bedroom and slid the small clock out from between the tablecloths. It was not particularly valuable. She pulled out the bottom drawer of her tool chest and lifted the corner of a thick knitted blanket, under which eleven small clocks and wristwatches nestled amongst the spare bedding. As she slipped her latest acquisition next to the others, she tried not to contemplate which unfortunate member of staff might be blamed for the missing item. She would return upstairs when the clock had wound down and move the hands to the same hour as her other concealed timepieces, because as she caressed each glass face before closing the drawer, every single one was set to exactly four minutes past ten, the moment her mother had breathed her last and the time her father had also set his gold pocket watch to. Mindful her father would be cross if the meal was served even one minute later than he'd requested, she scurried down to the kitchen to peel the potatoes. Chapter Two during the week, from the serving of breakfast until the preparation of the evening meal, Pearl's time was largely her own. As long as the household chores were completed and there was food on the table exactly when required, her father was largely content. He had high standards. The cutlery must be laid out just so, and he struggled if she dared to rearrange the ornaments. But she was generally a compliant daughter who tried to avoid giving him reasons to complain. They had been at the former parsonage for ten years now, which was quite a relief to Pearl, because they had moved about so much during her early childhood. The house was in an isolated location, and so it was natural for Raymond Glenham to assume his daughter spent her free hours housekeeping, reading, and gardening. To be fair, much of her time was spent this way, but since finishing her education at fourteen, she'd found other activities to fill her time, most of which revolved around her love for the water. Even in her sleep, the sea came to her, edging endless rolling sands and disappearing into the thick blue line across the distant horizon. She would dream of the beautiful white horses of spume running along the crest, and, as the waves folded in on themselves and into the shoreline, that beautiful whooshing sound as they broke. Sometimes, she envisaged her legs stretching down the beach as the tide brought each wave a little closer to her toes before receding and coming at her again. And the repetitiveness of such a thing, much like the repetitiveness of her days, was inexplicably soothing. Always a child, Pearl often wondered how she might have turned out had her mother still been alive. 
Her father positively loathed the sea, so they had never lived anywhere coastal, and when she talked of it, he visibly shuddered. She occasionally engineered day trips with friends to Lowestoft or Felixstowe, but living in the heart of Suffolk, it was far too arduous a journey to undertake often, so instead she gravitated to inland bodies of water. She spent a lot of her free time walking along riverbanks in the winter and playing in Lackley Lake during the summer. Just before the war, as a small girl, her interest in swimming as an activity had been piqued when women were finally allowed to compete in the sport at the Olympic Games. Self-taught, she became a surprisingly competent swimmer and perhaps even imagined herself winning medals for a while. A veritable mermaid, her friend said, and although her life was not terrible, it was suffocating, so she relished in the freedom that came to her when she swam in the lake, cutting through the water like a fish and diving beneath the surface to escape everything above. The day after her escapades at Boxley Hall, she spent the afternoon with her friend Harriet Crawley. It was particularly humid for late June, and so they headed for the lake on their bicycles. Harriet had learned that if she wanted to spend time with Pearl, it would invariably involve water, and, on such a sultry day, she had readily agreed, even though Pearl knew her former school friend would spend more time lying on the banks, regaling her with gossip than actually swimming. They set a blanket down at the water's edge, and within minutes, Pearl was splashing about in the middle of the lake. Her body was hot, making the contrast of the icy water even greater, but, as always, this sudden shock to her system was a welcome one. It made her feel alive. As her slender arms swept out in synchronised semicircles and her legs kicked furiously beneath the surface, she became increasingly frustrated by the weight of her costume. How she longed for her childhood when she'd taken to the lake in nothing but her drawers. Unfortunately, an elderly rambler had come across her when she was thirteen, which put paid to such liberty. Instead, she had rather daringly purchased a one-piece cotton-knit bathing suit in navy blue from a department store in Ipswich, preferable to the high necks, long sleeves and woollen stockings of costumes from before the war, but still somewhat restrictive. Many parents would be scandalised by such a purchase, but as with most matters regarding his daughter, her father, besides, the only person who saw her in it was her best friend Harriet, who owned a similar article, but whose parents had little to say in their headstrong daughter's choice of swimwear. In fact, they had little to say in anything she undertook. This will all come to an end once you're married. Harriet wriggled into her bathing suit, but remained on the bank, watching her friend flip over onto her back, tip her head up to the blue cloud-dotted sky, and bob both feet to the surface. Your days will be filled with the company of tedious society ladies, flower arranging and organising church bazaars. I shan't marry him, Pearl said, with more conviction than she felt. You will, because you always do what you're told. I've never once heard you say no to your father, and, as he has determined that you will marry Simon Trowbridge, it will happen. But we both know you'll be desperately unhappy. The man has no interest in you. That much is plain to see. Pearl swished her hands through the water to paddle herself closer to Harriet. It was the very point she, herself, had failed to comprehend. Why had Simon Trowbridge singled her out for special attention? She had no fortune. In fact, the opposite was true. The match would bring her and her father the much sought-after financial security they craved, as well as a certain admiration for being wed to a highly decorated and respected war hero. Simon professed to find her charming and attractive, but his eyes were insincere, and she could not warm to him. It bothered her that he clearly disliked his potential father-in-law, and she couldn't help but wonder if he was beholden to him in some way, especially since the potential arrangement included her father living nearby. It seemed she would never escape her familial duties. Harriet stretched out her long legs and wriggled her toes, far happier bathing in golden sunlight than icy waters. 
I love you dearly, but it worries me that you've not lived a life. And if you don't do so before you marry, you can be certain there will be little opportunity when you have a family and endless domestic responsibilities. I already have endless domestic responsibilities. Pearl kicked her feet, twisting her body to one side, and began to swim in small circles, revelling in the gentle caresses of the water and the glorious sense of weightlessness that accompanied it. Exactly! So, I will ask you again to accompany my family on our transatlantic trip next month. Father will happily pay your ticket because Mother says I need a companion to keep me in check, and she likes you for all the reasons that you frustrate me. You are suitably sedate and well-behaved. Perhaps a little of each of us will rub off on the other. Now, would not... The prohibition of alcohol may be inconvenient. You know how much I love a tipple. But there will be other distractions. New York City truly is the capital of the world. We can dance to jazz in Harlem, watch baseball in the new Yankee Stadium, and admire the skyscrapers of Manhattan. Pearl shook her head. Her friend was so much braver than her. The thought of engaging in salacious dance moves in public spaces or watching a ball game she didn't understand, surrounded by excitable young men, frightened her. Harriet embraced new opportunities and reveled in mischief. Pearl was like her father. She felt safe with the familiar. And yet there was a part of her that was curious about the unknown and even the utterly reckless. From browsing the books in her father's modest library, she wondered what it would be like to see the mighty lions of Africa gaze upon the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel or walk through the street markets of India. It would be thrilling to behold the vibrant colours a photograph could not convey and to breathe in the exotic spices that she had never tasted. But her father's voice echoing in her ears always held her back. We aren't that sort of people, Pearl. These are dangerous places. Anything could happen. And a small part of her always wondered if that wasn't rather the point. So... Whilst she was exhilarated by her stealing, the terrifying part was over in moments. For a trip of the magnitude her friend was proposing, the fear would last for weeks. Harriet stood up and dipped her toes into the icy lake. She shivered. You're a water personality, Pearl. Your father surely must have sensed it, even as you were born, for you couldn't have been given a more appropriate name. It's like you came from the sea as the pearl comes from the oyster. Look at how you come alive when you're swimming. If only you would embrace other areas of your life so eagerly. They'd had this conversation many times before, her eager friend pushing her to be bolder and braver. But if Harriet's faith in the centuries-old belief of the mystical nature of the four elements and her passion for astrology were justified, not that Pearl believed in such nonsense, then it rather explained her fear and lack of trust. She was calm and competent, sensitive and reflective, which was, apparently, all down to the positioning of various celestial objects on the day she was born. I wish you had more fire in you. What I wouldn't give to see you punch a door, scream in frustration, or weep openly at something that has moved you. It's not healthy to keep your emotions buttoned up reflecting that it was an unfortunate display of such behaviour from Harriet's father, Mr Crawley, that had led to the family's decision to embark on their imminent trip. The punch on the nose he delivered to a well-respected gentleman in a public arena, when he'd overheard a scandalous rumour relating to his wife, only served to grab the attention of an unscrupulous journalist, who decided this made the rumour true. Escaping abroad for a while seemed sensible, Pearl had determined that wheresoever she decided to further her knowledge of the world and the adventures undertaken across it, it would certainly never be from the newspapers, whose salacious and headline-seeking falsehoods destroyed lives. Harriet finally ducked her body under the water and let out a tiny squeal. Pearl smiled and swam over to persuade her into deeper waters. She took her friend's hands so that her body could float on the surface, finally letting go and allowing Harriet to kick her legs for a few yards before she lost confidence and found the soft, silty bottom of the lake with her feet. 
It wasn't long before Harriet's limbs became weary from her exertions, and she clambered from the water, hanging her heavy soaking wet costume over the branches of a low bush to dry in the sun. Pearl swam back out to the middle of the lake. Her fingers were wrinkled prunes, and her body was tired, but she was reluctant to leave her happy place. She took a deep breath and ducked below the surface, closing her eyes. The sound of her heartbeat amplified, and everything around her became muffled, cushioning her from the challenging world above. If only she could stay down here, away from all the pressures and demands of those around her, because she had an uneasy feeling about the proposed trip to Dorset. Here in the water, she was safe. Here, she felt her mother was nearby. Here, she was truly at home. It was only later that evening, when Pearl was drawing the curtains in her father's immaculately organised study, that she stumbled across a genuine reason to be anxious. With a view to being better informed about the trip, she reached for the envelope he'd been waving about the day before and slid the single sheet of paper out. She cast guilty eyes towards the door, worried that her father might enter and catch her prying. But the house was silent. The invitation began in a formal manner, covering the details she already knew. They were cordially invited to attend Highcliffe House for the Saturday and over into the Sunday, where they would attend an intimate dinner party. It would be in the best interests of Raymond Glenham to... The implication being that he was in line for a sizable payout. Pearl had never heard of the Brockhursts, but assumed they were distant relations, perhaps on her mother's side. The invitation went on to say that he and his daughter would be made most welcome and staff would be on hand to ensure they had a pleasant stay. But it was the last lines of the correspondence that made Pearl freeze. She reread the final paragraph just to make sure she had correctly interpreted the dark nature of what was a very thinly disguised threat. I strongly suggest you accept this invitation as the consequences of any refusal to attend will prove catastrophic, forcing me to reveal dark secrets that I am certain you would rather remain hidden. You must have known that your past would catch up with you eventually. Yours faithfully, Mr. Badgerwood. Chapter 3 the bus dropped Pearl and her father in the centre of Morton Peveril, a picturesque South Dorset village twelve miles from Weymouth. It was a hot day and she was glad of her straw hat to protect her from the fierce sun. Their journey had taken most of the Friday and she was pleased that her father had suggested an overnight stop. Arriving irritable and dishevelled at a guesthouse was one thing, turning up to a private residence in such a state was quite another. Pearl could smell the sea as the bus pulled away, even though she could not yet see it. Walking down to the Esplanade in Weymouth the previous day had, naturally, been the first thing she'd done after depositing her suitcase in the tiny attic guest room. The lateness of the hour, however, had prevented her from spending longer than a few minutes walking along the glorious flat sandy beach. Today, at Highcliffe House, she hoped there would be an opportunity for her to bathe, and the sticky air surrounding them made this an even more appealing prospect. A painted village sign, depicting a small fishing boat sailing in front of high cliffs, stood in the middle of the open square, mounted on a tall whitewashed post. A smattering of shops surrounded them, including a bustling fishmonger's, which added to the salty coastal smells, and a quaint tea room with a large bay window. We need to find someone prepared to take us to the house, he said. Can we not walk there? It would not be practical with our cases and in this heat. Perhaps we could ask in here. And she pointed to the Morton Peveril General Stores. The signage announced the proprietor was a G.W. Lane and that it also served as the village post office. If they dealt with the... Her father hesitated a fraction before striding ahead of her through the open door and into the murkiness of the shop, which was made worse by the contrast of the blindingly bright day outside. 
As her eyes adjusted to the low light, Pearl noticed a figure standing behind the counter. There was an array of shelves running around the walls, stacked with tins and packets of every description, and sacks of flour and rice on the floor. Along the wooden counter stood a mechanical cash register, a set of brass scales, and a neat display of fries chocolate. Mr. Hardinger? The voice was female, and the woman leaned forward and frowned at her father. Uh, Mr. Glenham, her father corrected. You must have confused me with someone else. I'm not local. So sorry, I do apologize. The mind plays tricks, especially when you've been around as long as I have. She shrugged. Must have been thousands of people passed through these doors over the years. Not at all. I believe I have one of those faces. He smiled briefly to indicate that he'd not taken offence. My daughter and I need transportation to Highcliffe House, if at all possible. Would you know anyone prepared to help us in this regard? You're in luck. Jerry is making a delivery there shortly. There are some items that got left off the order yesterday. That house has been shut up for so many years, whilst the Brockhursts gallivanted around the world. The vicar's wife received the occasional postcard to say all was well, but now it would appear they have finally returned and opened up the place. As we understand, they have guests. She paused. I can only assume that you are some of the guests. It is a large gathering, then? Her father asked, looking faintly surprised. The invitation had described the dinner as intimate. Not especially, but my husband is delivering supplies for seven or eight. We had an order placed in writing a week ago from a Mr. Badgerwood, with more than sufficient payment enclosed. Strange way of going about it, if you ask me, but money is money. Pearl recognised the name from the invitation, and so did her father. What do you know of this Mr. Badgerwood? he inquired. Is he perhaps a solicitor? or agent of some description? Never heard of him before. He's certainly not local, so I'm assuming he's related to Virgil. Pretty sure the Warren line ended with Leonora. Remembering the man before her was a stranger, she elaborated, the Warrens owned Highcliffe House for decades, and not long after they died, their only daughter married some fancy American called a Virgil about twenty years ago, they indicated they were planning to settle back here, only to dash off again almost immediately in the middle of the night, and they haven't been back since. She leaned forward to emphasise her point. Who does that with a tiny baby in tow? You can be sure that something scared them away, or someone forced them to leave. It never sat right with me. Pearl's father shrugged. Gossip wasn't his thing, nor were people, but she was unnerved. Meeting new people was bad enough, but nothing about this visit sat easily with her. The house clearly had a peculiar history, and her father was being blackmailed into attending the dinner party. Because she was absolutely certain that the invitation was exactly that. Blackmail. Chapter Four Highcliffe House, apart from its size, was in no other way magnificent. It was a typical Georgian-style box, with very little ornament or intrigue, and built from the creamy white local stone that Pearl understood was used in such prestigious buildings as St. Paul's Cathedral and Buckingham Palace. A Greek portico marked the main entrance, which gave it a mildly interesting focal point, but she prefers houses with more character, the higgledy-piggledy rooftops and overhanging first floors of a Tudor townhouse, the steep-pitched roofs and glorious red-brick chimneys of the Victorians, or the pink-washed, low-thatched cottages of her home county. The surrounding landscape was magnificent, however, and she caught her breath as the G.W. Lane liveried van spluttered to a halt after travelling up the long drive. A cerulean blue sky, with the merest smudge of cloud, supplied a splendid backdrop to the vibrant green lawns and lofty, ancient trees that had surely graced the landscape from a long time before she'd been born. Flower beds danced along the drive, haphazard and overcrowded, but recently tended to nonetheless. 
and then a glimpse of the dark blue streak of ocean between the horizon and the top of the dramatic coastal cliffs that must have been the inspiration for the house name. She could smell the sea, carried on the air that was rushing in through the open window of the van, a salty freshness overlaid with the tang of fish. Mr Lane deposited them at the front of the property, and she stepped out onto the gravel. A smart red Austin motor car was abandoned near a fading mauve rhododendron bush. Pearl didn't know anyone wealthy enough to own such a vehicle and was both intrigued and anxious about meeting someone with that kind of money. As the grocer's van started, a young man, dressed in the black suit and crisp white shirt of staff, appeared at the front door. Mr. and Mrs. Glenham? he inquired, immediately following up with a wide smile. My name is Ellery Brown, and I will endeavour to make your stay at Highcliffe House as comfortable as possible. I trust that you both had a pleasant journey. Her father didn't reply, but merely nodded to indicate the cases on the ground by their feet before walking up the stone steps and through the open door. Pearl followed meekly behind, used to her father's lack of social skills. The young man raised an eyebrow, and it was only then that she noticed his extraordinary eyes. They were a startling amber, with flecks of gold that reflected the ascending summer sun, with a darker ring of brown around each iris. His thick hair was parted at the side and had a glossy sheen to it, doubtless from the liberal application of brilliantine, which only made those orange eyes stand out even more. Someone needs a lesson in manners, he muttered under his breath, and Pearl considered that he might need a lesson in manners too. However dismissive her father had been, this young man was employed to assist and defer to the guests of the house, and he should know it was not his place to openly criticise, least of all to the gentleman's daughter. He picked up their cases, one in each hand, and nodded for Pearl to enter the house, following behind as she stepped over the threshold. Shuffling past them, he then deposited the cases at the foot of the main staircase. Pearl gazed in wonder at the great number of strange objects and colourful artworks that confronted them as they entered the spacious hallway. She felt as though she'd stepped into a museum gallery. The square open space was crammed with glass display cabinets and mounted exhibits, displaying everything from stuffed mammals to brass instruments and a whole host of things in between. Overwhelming, isn't it? he said, and all down to Lenora and Virgil Brockhurst. Ellery drew their attention to a huge oil painting above the staircase that dominated the hall, positioned so that the couple could look down on all who entered their house. Virgil was seated on a lush green velvet chair, a self-satisfied smile across his wide, whiskered face. Lenora stood beside him, one delicate hand resting on his shoulder, wearing a late Victorian gown of pale pink satin. Her dark hair was piled high on her head, with tiny curls framing her face. You could tell she was a force to be reckoned with, if only by the confident way. Pearl felt uneasy under their intense scrutiny and returned her gaze to the objects dotted about the hallway. Is that a shrunken head? she asked incredulously and rather hoping that it wasn't. A wooden carving of one, perhaps? I'm rather afraid it is. It's Ecuadorian. Look at the label. The indigenous schwa boil down the heads of their enemies to keep their souls contained and prevent them seeking revenge, or some such. The young manservant was surprisingly well-educated and articulate for someone working in service. Brockhurst really liked his macabre curios. Rumour has it that he once briefly owned the finger of some medieval Catholic saint, but the Vatican got involved and I suspect he and the finger were quickly parted. He also had a large jar containing the pickled bodies of conjoined puppies. My mother informed me this particular item was taken off display after the mayor's wife came for afternoon tea and fainted. Such tales travel fast in this part of the world, and you know how the local rags are always desperate for a good story. Pearl did indeed know. 
Her dearest friend had suffered as a consequence, but wished she hadn't asked and chose not to investigate anything else, instead returning her attention to the walls, casting her eye across the paintings of exotic landscapes, classical ruins, and city skylines. They travelled an awful lot, the young man explained, following her gaze. Her father began to tap his foot, a sure sign he was agitated and bored by this meaningless interchange. I'll take your luggage up to your rooms, Ellery said, whilst Mrs. Dawson, the lady engaged to cook for the party, serves you welcome refreshments on the terrace. We are the only two members of staff employed for this occasion, so our roles are numerous. Please be understanding if things take longer than anticipated. He gestured to the door on their left. Mr. Stanfield arrived not half an hour before you and is currently enjoying Mr. Badgerwood's hospitality outside. The twinkle in his mesmerizing eyes was unmistakable. This was a man who was brimming with mischief and opinions and struggling to contain them. And our host? her father asked. Is he with Mr. Stanfield? Ah, no, but... There you probably know more than me, as Mr. Badgerwood and I have never met. You've not met your employer? Her father was incredulous. Neither myself nor Mrs. Dawson have had that pleasure. We were engaged through a third party, and our instructions for this gathering have all been via letter. I understand the gentleman, but there is no sign of him as yet, sir. This is simply unacceptable, Mr. Glenham continued. We've been dragged halfway across the country and he isn't even here to greet us. I was hoping for some enlightenment as to the precise nature of our visit, as I've not met the fellow either, he admitted. Never even heard of him. How odd. Mr. Stanfield said something similar. Rather curious to my mind, as you are both invited guests. Curious indeed. Her father rubbed at his chin. Is Badgerwood the current owner? or some sort of legal chap overseeing the intricacies of the Brockhurst's affairs. The young man shrugged. I can only reiterate that I have been employed from the Friday through to the Monday. The temporary nature of the position suited me, but it would appear that you know even less than I. Pearl was confused. Her father didn't know Mr. Badgerwood. That meant he was effectively being blackmailed by a stranger, she would not dare to question him over the matter, as she didn't want him to know she'd been snooping. But if it wasn't the sender of the invitation he had the connection with, then it must be the place. He'd been to Highcliffe House before, but was not prepared to admit it. Of that, she was certain. Voices tumbled out into the hallway, so Pearl and her father followed the chatter and found themselves in a spacious drawing room. The walls were papered in a pleasing flocked print of pale blue, both above and below the dado rail, and the furniture was a curious mix of solid English country pieces and alarmingly ostentatious oriental items, such as the gaudy black and gold chinoiserie sideboard along the back wall. Pearl noticed a slender older woman holding a tray of drinks, silhouetted in the sunlight as she stood at the open French doors. Behind her on the terrace was a portly gentleman, sprawled across an overly fancy wicker chair that looked far too fragile for his bulky form. His hair was thinning, betraying his age, but he had a vibrancy about him that was refreshing, with a booming voice that was certainly more melodic than her father's monotone speech. Pearl was used to his sedate inactivity and gentle stillness, yet the other guest was waving his hands about and pulling the most expressive faces. His casual clothes, tennis sweater and tweed jacket, spoke of serious money, and it was quickly apparent that he had the arrogant demeanour to match. Enough with the elderflower cordial and repeated offers of tea. A fellow needs something stiffer if he's to endure this ridiculous pantomime. It's not too early for a white lady, you know. You have creme de I'm sorry, sir, the lady replied, dipping her head and taking a step back. Please do bear in mind, this house has not been occupied for nearly twenty years, and Mr. Badgerwood has only had delivered what he considered necessary for this gathering. Creme de monde is a necessity, as is an ashtray. 
What's a chap to do with his ash? I'll see what I can find, sir. She turned back to the room, and the pair spotted the new arrival simultaneously. Good God! The abdominous man stood up as the Glenhams approached, but before he could say anything further, her father interjected, Raymond Glenham, delighted to make your acquaintance, and this is my daughter, Pearl. The pair locked eyes momentarily and then shook hands. Hello, Stanfield. The pleasure is all mine. Mr. Stanfield nodded at Pearl and gestured for her to take a seat before hitching up his cream flannel trousers and returning to the wicker chair. She noticed that he sat slightly more upright than previously. Clearly something had piqued his interest, and she suspected they were the something. Mrs. Dawson, at your service, the woman half curtsied as she introduced herself. Do help yourself to a glass of the elderflower. I will return presently. Well, this is quite a did do Stanfield said, reaching for a packet of cigarettes on the small circular table between them all. He held it out to both in turn, but they declined. Gathering people for a dinner party, and not even here to greet your guests. That cookwoman informs me that a Signor and Signora Ravello are also on their way, and then I understand our little party is complete. Do you know the Ravellos? Her father shook his head. Pearl poured her father and herself a small glass of the cordial and promptly drank hers in one go. Travelling in the heat was exhausting, and even though she was thankful fashions were increasingly for simpler clothes, she still had on more lairs than she would have liked. If only she could sneak away from this unnerving gentleman, retrieve her bathing suit from her case, and escape down to the sea. Out on the terrace she could hear it, calling to her. The screams of the gulls and the hush and hiss of breaking waves were carried on the slight breeze that came from the sea not three hundred yards beyond where they sat. She realised with a start that the bumptious gentleman had been speaking to her, but her mind had been elsewhere. Oh, pay her no heed, Mr. Stanfield. Harlow, please. And you must call me Raymond. She's not one for conversation, doesn't much like people, and has very little of value to contribute. But it was a sign that something was bothering him. It was one of his little tics. She followed his eyes and saw the dusting of cigarette ash that had fallen onto the table. He did not cope well with mess or things not being in their proper place. If they were at home, she would have jumped up to find a brush. But it was not her place to do so, and she luxuriated in this knowledge. As she sat back in her chair and allowed herself a moment to enjoy being still after so much travelling, the most glamorous woman Pearl had ever encountered sashayed out through the French doors. She was wearing an exquisitely tailored bright blue suit with cream silk details. A voluminous orange scarf was casually slung about her neck, its tasseled edges nearly reaching the floor. And across her eyebrows sat a tight-fitting toque hat in a blue that matched the suit. Her heavily mascaraed eyelashes curled upwards to meet the thin brim. She was followed by a handsome, slender gentleman who was inadvertently slapped across the face by the gloves she was holding as she waved her arms about. Mr. Stanfield and her father both got to their feet and exchanged a glance that Pearl didn't understand. Céline Ravello, and this is my husband, Aldo she announced, stretching out her elegant hand and graciously allowing both men to kiss it. The woman had a strong Gallic accent, even though Ravello was surely an Italian name. C'est un plaisir to meet you all. She met the gaze of the gentleman with incredible self-assurance. The necessary introductions were made, but everyone was unusually reticent to expand much beyond their name, and then Aldo said several sentences in Italian, where the only word Pearl thought she recognised was mangiare. This, she assumed, was to eat, like the French manger, as he put his fingers to his lips to suggest exactly this. Well, I say, an international union. How charming. At least you married an ally. 
Stanfield said to Signora Ravello, shaking the proffered appendage. Oui, and a most fortuitous union at that. Lucky for me. He has wealth, if not intelligence. I say, uh, how much does the fellow understand? Stanfield asked, frowning at the husband, whose face betrayed nothing. Very little. It suits him that way. He has made no attempt to learn any language other than his own, and, to be honest, he uses little of that unless he is angry with me. Quite frankly, I do not understand. And he raised an eyebrow in return, so she said a few words in his native tongue that seemed to satisfy him. You should have married an Englishman. We're jolly bright. Stanfield gestured for her to take a seat. Perhaps, she purred. But you are not, I think, uh, as accomplished lovers. The way she emphasized that last word, stretching it out and allowing that guttural R to roll around the back of her throat, made Pearl nearly spit out her freshly poured cordial. She made a gurgling sound as she swallowed her drink and hastily retrieved a handkerchief from her sleeve to pat her mouth. After seating his wife... Aldo took a chair that was slightly away from the group and proceeded to slip a small brown leather volume from his inside jacket pocket. Ars Amatoria was down the spine in gold and he quickly became absorbed in his book, only looking up when Mrs Dawson reappeared with a saucer-sized engraved brass bowl that she placed on the table. I couldn't find an ashtray, sir, so I'm afraid this pot will have to do. No! Celine jumped up from the table and stuck out an imperious hand. Mrs. Dawson, wide-eyed, handed it over, and the Frenchwoman turned it around in her elegant hands. This is 17th century. Persian. These are talismanic cartouches, and here, about the rim, is an Arabic invocation. To use such an item will be summoning the malevolent spirits, and things are certainly strange enough without such recklessness. Something more taken from the people it belonged to, Celine said with a forlorn look across her face. C'est dangereux to treat the sacred objects of others as mere trinkets. Mrs. Dawson looked slightly embarrassed as Celine returned the bowl to her. Well, I'm... Very sorry, madam, to be sure. I'll see if there isn't a saucer or something in the cupboards that will suffice. Pearl was fascinated by the description of the little bowl. She loved learning about anything beyond the staid and silent four walls of home. Her life might be dull, but her interests weren't, and books allowed her to escape into a life their finances and her timidity didn't permit. Once, when she was younger, she determined to read through the entirety of the eight volumes of her father's old encyclopedias. She only got to page 94 of volume one because its alphabetized nature did not lend itself to chronological, or indeed engaging, reading. But she now knew an awful lot about the Dutch port of Aalborg, or Abdul Hamid II was the Sultan. Dinner will be served at seven o'clock prompt. Mrs. Dawson eyed the assembled company to stress the necessary punctuality of the meal, and Pearl noticed her father's discomfort at the news his meal would be an hour later than he was used to. Pre-dinner drinks will be held in the drawing room at half-past six. As all guests are now present, would you like an early luncheon? It can be served on the terrace or in the dining room, if midday suits. The general consensus was that everyone was indeed peckish. In fact, Aldo looked decidedly animated when his wife translated the question. All had risen early to travel, and the clement nature of the day lent itself to outside dining. So the older lady rang the bell next to the fireplace, summoned the young manservant, and ordered that the larger wooden garden table be set accordingly. There was an hour to spare, and Pearl had hoped to visit the cove to satisfy her increasingly desperate desire to swim in the sea. But her father had other ideas. The luggage needs seeing to. I would like my suits hung up, or I'll be no better than a tramp this evening, dining in a crumpled rag. He didn't need to explicitly make the request. She was being told to attend to this matter, and promptly. Of course, father. Would you show my daughter our rooms? Her father asked Ellery, 
who had now appeared, and the young man nodded his assent. You're brave old chap, commented Stanfield, letting the pair of them head up to the boudoirs unchaperoned. He gave Pearl an unpleasant wink. I'd offer myself, if I knew which room she'd been put in. We could test the firmness of the mattress. His comment was wholly inappropriate, and Ellery's amber eyes flashed wide. For a moment, she thought he was about to put the older man in his place, but, possibly remembering his position, he thought better of it. Pearl, on the other hand, wanted to curl up and die right there on the terrace, preferably before slithering between the gaps in the paving slabs. They had been at Highcliff House less than an hour, and she was already desperate to return to the sanctuary of the parsonage. This trip was proving far, far worse than she ever could have imagined. Chapter 5 Ellery extended his arm to direct an embarrassed Pearl back inside the house. Why did your father not say something when Mr. Stanfield made that inexcusable comment? Ellery asked in a hushed voice as he led her out into the hallway. She shrugged. He doesn't think like that. Besides, I'm certain it was just a joke, and Father doesn't really understand jokes. Do you know the purpose of this dinner party? She asked. It seems strange to gather people together who have no prior acquaintance. We know very little, Ellery said, looking across at the cook, who had just that moment appeared in the hallway carrying a refilled jug of cordial. She'd obviously caught the end of their conversation. It is bewildering to me that everyone who has been invited to Highcliffe House knows very little, including the staff, Mrs. Dawson almost whispered. I did some research into the history of the house when I knew I'd got the job, if it helps, the young man said. It was built by the Warren family, that was Leonora Brockhurst's maiden name, and when I asked my mother, she assumed the Brockhursts still owned it. She lives just outside Weymouth, so near enough to hear the local gossip. Apparently, Leonora and Virgil were great travellers and often away from home for months at a time. But the fact that they haven't been seen for so many years is curious, don't you think? I'm not local. Don't look at me, the older lady said. Pearl knew some of this information already from Mrs. Lane, but kept quiet. Mother said the marriage was quite the scandal because she was engaged to someone else, Ellery continued, and Virgil was rather the playboy with more money than he knew what to do with. He spent his twenties travelling around the world, splashing his fortune about and buying up artworks and antiquities left, right and centre, including some pretty controversial artefacts, like those you see about you. Signora Ravello probably has a point when she says they shouldn't have been plundered from their people. He seemed unusually keen to enlighten her. The Brockhursts travelled extensively after their marriage and only returned to England when they had a child. Back for a few days in the spring of 1903, and then disappeared off again. There was the occasional postcard to friends mentioning their latest destination, but nothing in recent years. Makes me wonder if something dreadful happened to them in some foreign clime, and if so, was it an accident or something darker? Not everything in life has to be a great drama, Mrs. Dawson said. Perhaps they are simply back from twenty years of travelling and want to surprise everyone. She shrugged, clearly not as enthralled by the mystery as Ellery. Perhaps, Ellery concurred. Perhaps not. Either way, we don't have time to stand about chatting, she reminded him, and Miss Glenham is probably keen to unpack before luncheon. If there is no specific agenda for the afternoon, I was hoping to go down to the cove. Is that allowed? She felt unusually bold to ask such a thing. 